You may have already read about the tale of East Tennessee State's football team trying to get to their game against the Citadel over the weekend. If you haven't heard it, prepare to have your mind blown. Because what they had to do to get to Charleston was crazy. They basically went through all of the stuff you're seeing on the news about the devastation in East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. They drove through it all. They were stuck in it all trying to get to this game. We talked to Trey Lamb, the East Tennessee State football coach, told us the whole story and then the rest of the story after they got back. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about it with him, but also just for those, if you want to help, because you, when you hear this story, you, you may say, hey, how can I help some of these people? And I'm not talking about the football players. I'm talking about the people who live in these areas. Uh, the American Red Cross, Tennessee region, the Amer American Red Cross in North Carolina, if you'd like to help, you could donate there, be it supplies, be it cash. There's a lot of people who need your help. And I th that's why Trey wanted to come on because he wanted to explain the stories of these people because they saw it all in front of their own eyes as they were trying to get to this game. So here is Trey Lamb from East Tennessee State. Honored to be joined now by Trey Lamb, the head coach at East Tennessee State University. Trey, you had one of the most unbelievable weekends that any college football coach has ever had that started Friday morning at 1030 a.m. when your buses rolled out of Johnson City. I, you had to go to the Citadel to cover, you know, to play a football game. And it's in the middle of the hurricane coming through North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. It feels like 10 minutes in, like things got nuts. How, how did, how did all that go down Friday morning? Yeah. You know, we were debating on, you know, waiting a couple hours and seeing what it did in the area also debating on taking a different route up through Virginia uh, down to Winston-Salem and kind of down 95 that way, which would have taken about nine or 10 hours. Um, and we also thought about leaving earlier um, that morning. And I think any of those options probably would have been better than what we did. If we had waited, we probably would have, would have uh, realized that there was no path through on 26 and it would have worked out better. And then if we had a, left earlier we probably would have split through there we missed it we missed it by about five to ten minutes um and we just hit it at the perfect time where uh, we left exactly when we shouldn't have and we got trapped right there where 26 closed behind us 26 had just closed in front of us and 40 was closed in both directions so we were in a little pocket right there with um about i don't know a thousand other stranded people surrounded by water um kind of in a little area of high ground right by i-26 but it, it all started that morning i you know i texted state trooper like 7 30 when i got up and said hey let me know if i need to make any travel adjustments um you know we, we need to come up with some options here and he was like look i think if we go the earlier we go the better we had a walk through at nine o'clock i told the team to stay around the coaches offices and as soon as we make the call we're going to get in the bus and go um and he thought you know, there was there's a river called the Nolichucky River, which is like 10 minutes from campus. And he thought if we could get through there, uh, we could get to I-40 and um, kind of get to main interstates and be able to make it to Charlotte and then down to Columbia to, and then to Charleston. But uh, we get about 15 minutes into the trip. The Nolichucky splits the highway behind us and floods the highway. So there's no way to get home. And then we get word that I-40 is closed in all directions. So we were stuck at that point. Um, about 15 minutes into the trip, we know it was going to be pretty bad. You're 10 minutes into the trip, and now you can't go home. Now, I remember waking up Friday morning and seeing pictures of I-40 at kind of near the Tennessee-North Carolina border where part of the road had just disappeared. So mm -hmm. I-40 is closed for miles and miles. You can't go through there. Try to go I-26. Can't go through I-26. I and then you just get stranded. What is that feeling like when you are – in buses and you're just sitting there for hours as as the water rises yeah it was a it was a terrible feeling you know um you feel responsible because you're the head coach and you know it's kind of your call and um i you know you, you sit there and kick yourself could have done some things different but at the moment man we had to we had to react on our feet you know there was um there was a lot of decisions that had to be made we, we originally parked down by a 
a shoe store um, in Fletcher, North Carolina. We tried to get off and go to Spartanburg Highway, and it was completely washed out, flooded. So we were completely stuck. We parked at a shoe store, and it was kind of low ground, and the water was rising into the parking lot. And I told the trooper, hey, we got to go. We got to get somewhere where, where we can get higher ground. It was kind of uh, put things in perspective because, I mean, there was literally families being rescued and walking out of the water 50 feet in front of us. We were watching it happen. Little kids, uh, people losing their homes, flooded trailers, flooded parking lots. Um, and the water was just rising and rising. And the, and the, it kind of put it in perspective. I kept saying to the coaches, like, hey, we, it could be worse, guys. We could be fighting for our lives. We could be, um, you know, could have lost our home today. We're going to get out of here no matter how long it takes. We're going to keep getting to higher ground and, and we're going to be okay. Um, so we go up to the Burger King, which is about, I don't know, 200 yards up the hill. Uh, where the water was still rising. So we got out of there. And then an hour later, that parking lot that we were in was 10 feet deep, deep of water. So um, we got out there and get to the Burger King. And we parked at the Burger King for about six hours. And the most frustrating thing about the whole thing is you could not get outside contact. You could not get cell service. Even our state trooper, his sat phone wouldn't work. He's got two emergency phones and a radio. And there's zero communication with the outside world. Um, one of our uh video people had a starlink um updated sat phone that we could get a couple texts out to so i text our director of operations and our ad and let them know what's going on i said you're going to need to email the parents right now on an email list because i know they're wondering where their kids are you need to email the coaches wives right now and tell them what's going on we're safe for the time being my plan is to get us to high ground try to find somewhere to stay for the night we're safe and see how we get out of here tomorrow when the water levels go down. But it was eerie, man. It was apocalyptic. Um, you felt like you were stuck in, you know, the 1900s, no cell service, no internet, no way to get any information. The rescue crews would come by every couple hours and you could ask them, hey, what's going on? At one point they told us, we may not get out of here there till Tuesday. That, that was one report I got back. Um, and then another reports were like, hey, it may be open tomorrow, it's Saturday at five o'clock. So then you're looking at 24 hours. Um, so it started getting dark and we go to Ingalls, um, the manager at Ingalls happened to be in there. It was locked. The, the lights were off. Obviously our police officer shined his light in there. They let us go in there and take a, a cart and get whatever we wanted and for free. So we pretty much raided the Ingalls, um, with sandwiches and sandwich meat and, uh, peanut butter sandwiches. And then we drove to the homeless shelter because we knew, it was on high ground. So we drove to the airport. We were going to park at the airport where well, the airport was flooded with people because that was kind of a safe haven. Uh, we were going to sleep in the airport, but it was already kind of taken by people evacuated. Then we drove to the homeless shelter, parked in the bottom of the parking lot, fed the players, and then we kind of dozed off there for a while. Um, so really two good Samaritans in this whole deal. The guy at Ingalls, you know, we're going to send him a care package, invite him to a game um you know do the whole thing there and then there's a guy from michigan that was stranded that gave a couple of our coaches a ride to use the bathroom um at a hotel they hitchhiked with him and then he ended up coming back at 1 30 in the morning and telling us that we were good to go and 26 was open coach when you're in a position where like you are a leader of men right like you know you're always mm -hmm. leading them into battle in the games and, and game planning and all this stuff like what is it like in a moment of crisis that has nothing to do with football like are you you know, still having to coach them on how to, you know, get through it. It's like a, a lesson too, in terms of just like how life doesn't go the way it's supposed to. Like, what is your temperament during this period of time, feeling responsibility for these kids, but also having to be the leader? Like, what were you, what was your inner turmoil like and how did you handle it? Yeah. You know, I became a head coach at 30 years old at Gardner Webb and we went through the whole COVID deal my first year, which was absolutely brutal. Um, the transfer portal, uh, NIL. So I've coached in the modern era of nothing. This is all I know. Uh, but that was certainly the most difficult position I've been in in my five years as a head coach. Um, anxiety levels were through the roof, but I was trying not to let anybody see it. Um, I was never necessarily scared for our lives, but I, I had just visions of us getting on top of a building or on top of the buses. And um, that was kind of my nightmare. I did not want to get to that point. I wanted to get somewhere where we could have safety, even if it was for two days, like some, we could find food, we could find bathrooms. Um, there's no power, but you know, I, I felt good about us being able to survive. If we got to a place of high ground where we could kind of set up shop for a couple of days, I didn't know how long it was going to be. Uh, but the anxiety, I, you know, a lot of prayer, you know, if you can just get us out of here and 
Um, you know, I think our players handled it probably better than I did. I, I let them stay on the bus. They slept most of the time. But, I mean, the frustrating part was just no contact with the outside world. We really were trying to get somewhere we could get cell service. Um, we couldn't find it. And um, But anxiety was high. Um, I don't like those situations. And uh, I thought we reacted well as a coaching staff. Our trainers did a great job. Uh, but it was it was certainly scary. So you mentioned the two good Samaritans, and, and I I can't wait to see the manager at Ingles when when he's honored in in Johnson City. That's going to be awesome. But you had two assistants. They they try to go you know try to find a bathroom. Mm -hmm. They get picked up by a guy from Michigan driving down the road, and he takes them to the bathroom. And then he comes back at 1.30 in the morning and knocks on the bus door to tell you the, the road is open. What was that moment like for you guys when you find out we might get out of here? Because you, you at yeah. that point, you, like you said, you, you're potentially hunkering down for two days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the key parts of that story that are kind of cool, the, the guy drove, so our guys are walking to a gas station. It's closed. Then they go to the airport. Airport bathrooms have no toilet paper, long story short. So now they're trying to get to a hotel, these three three coaches, um, and they flag down this guy in an electric vehicle. It's uh, like a, not a Tesla, but one of the electric vehicles. And most most people are out of gas, and gas stations were closed. And um, this electric vehicle drives by, and our office line coach is trying to hitchhike, and the guy turns back around, kind of shines light on him, and he says, hey, look, we're not weird. We're, not, we're, we're with a football team. We're just trying to get to a hotel. We heard that there was cell service at, at the at the uh, Hilton. That's another thing that was weird. You know, there's a bunch of people around because a lot of people are stranded. So you're hearing all these rumors of, hey, this place has this. This place has food. This place has a bathroom because um, you can't talk to anybody in the outside world. So, you know, some people are like, hey, we're going to be stranded for two days. Some people are like, hey, we're going to get out of here at midnight. So there was a lot of rumors going around. And you couldn't really get to the truth. So. Um, anyways, the guy comes back around. He says, Hey, we're not weird. We're the coaching staff we're, we're with a team and we're trying to get to a bathroom. He says, Hey, jump in. We'll take you up here. He was stranded from Michigan. Um, uh, take them to a, a hotel. They use the bathroom. They go to the top floor of the parking garage and they're able to call our wives. Got a little cell service up there, call our athletic director and let them know what was going on. Um, yeah. And the guy comes back and kind of saves us, um, knocks on the window or, or he knocked on the, def uh, the defensive bus. Defense coordinator had no idea who he was. Now, keep in mind, we're 200 yards from a homeless shelter with yeah. about 150 homeless people and evacuated people and, you know, kind of rough clientele. And and we're, we got a cop in front of us guarding our buses, our, our state trooper. Uh, but they pull up and knock. And honestly, it was kind of scary. He kind of freaked out a little bit. He's like, who are you? Why are you trying to get on our bus? What are you looking for? And he's like, I need to see Coach Joe which is our offensive line coach. And our coach Joe was on bus one. So he walks around to bus one, knocks on our window. I said, Hey, can I help you? He says, where's coach Joe? I said, he's under the bus sleeping. So they go down there and get Joe who hitchhiked with him and said, Hey, wakes him up. Uh, he was sleeping, sleeping like in the storage department department oh, of the, of oh, the wow. uh, in the storage area <laughs> under the bus where the bags are. Cause that's the only place you could really stretch out. Wakes, knocks on it, wakes him up and says, Hey, 20, I'm getting word. My buddy just drove in from town. 26 East is open. It's the only way out of town. You guys need to go. Um, so we cranked the buses. I sent the police officer ahead and said, hey, go check it out. So he drives back 30 minutes later and says, yeah, we can sneak through there. There's some water and some trees down, but I think we can make it. So we made the decision at that point to uh, to head down. And you get there at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And Waffle House is still open because... Of course, yeah. Waffle House is still yeah. open because Waffle House is also always open. How, how good does that feel when you get that team to a hotel, get them some Waffle House, and you know you made it? When we got when we got to Columbia, South Carolina, we got cell service, and that was about two thirty, and that's when it felt like a big relief. Like the roads were clear, we were south of the damage, south of the flooding. So when we got to Columbia, we were able to call people. So I called the director of operations who was at the hotel. She had not heard from us in 14 hours. No idea what's going on um, since 10 o'clock that morning. Called her, said, hey, we got out. We're on the way. I called my dad, called my wife, called the athletic director. This is 2.30 in the morning. It's our first contact really with anybody on a phone call. 
Um, so we were kind of getting everybody up to date. And I called her. I said, order as many waffles as you can, as many breakfast sandwiches as they can make. Go pick them up and have them ready for our guys. Uh, there's a call in the morning at 6.30 with the athletic direct, uh, Citadel's athletic director, the Southern Conference Commissioner, and the presidents to figure out what's going to happen with this game. I said, I want to play it no matter what. We've been through hell and back. Um, our kids want to play. Um, that was the only option we had because we weren't making it back to Johnson City. That it, The roads going north were a disaster. So at least if you went further south, you were you were out of the flooding for the most part. Um, so once we got out of the flooding, I was I felt great. About, I, I didn't care if we stayed in Charleston for four days um, as long as we were safe and away from from the damage and the flooding. Uh, but our area is super affected up here, man. There's there's a lot of people missing in the surrounding counties and uh, Western North Carolina. Boone is absolutely washed out, which is about 45 minutes from here. Asheville is a disaster. Uh, Unicoi County is 50 people missing, which is like 10 minutes from our campus. The water was shut off for the weekend up here. It's uh, it's it's been it's been pretty bad. We've got you know a, a girl on our um, video staff who is missing family members. There there's there's a lot of there's a lot of damage up here, and um, it's been pretty rough. So, like, how you played this game? You won this mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. But what you just talked about, like, how much bigger is all of this than just a game? But that said, you mentioned it was important to play the game. Like, how, 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 what was that three and a half hours like? Yeah, you know, I think the we we lacked focus. We did not play very well, to be honest with you. But I didn't expect much. Um, I did tell the team before the game, look, we're not going to make excuses. Whatever happens, going to happen. We're going to go play this game and see what happens. Um, but I think the biggest thing is we grew together on that trip. And, you know, when things like that happen, you can – it's easy to get annoyed with each other. It's easy to fight and moan and complain. But our guys didn't do that. They made the most of it. They were still in good spirits, laughing, joking. Um, we got out to the parking lot at the homeless shelter and played music and kind of had a little dance competition. We had no phones, so the guys were kind of going, going crazy. Uh, but when we got to Charleston, they were ready to play. They slept from about five till noon. We got them up at one o'clock, ate, ate lunch, and went and played football. Um, and you could tell we didn't play very good. We had four turnovers and 11 penalties and still found a way to win the game. So, um, you know, really proud of the way our guys responded. We got in a resilient group, and we didn't really didn't make any excuses, and I'm proud of that. Yeah, uh, it seems like uh, quite the ordeal and, and hoping, obviously, for the safety and, and welfare of the people in your area. Uh, what's it been like getting back to campus? How's, how's the vibe there? And, and what's, you know, next for you and, and this team? Got back at 6 o'clock last night, and there was, I don't know, a couple hundred people, welcome party, um, kind of welcoming us, welcoming us back, and uh, fans and faculty and um, administrators. That was cool. Um, but the Appalachian region, man, is in, in dire need right now. And I think that's the biggest, uh, biggest message we're trying to send is like, Hey, uh, if we can be a beacon of light for this community and we got homecoming this week against a rivalry in Chattanooga, we play for the, the rail trophy and, um, big rivalry game, uh, for this area. And, and this fan base really cares about East Tennessee state and, and we care about the fan base and, um, you know, we're just praying for all the people that are still missing and the families and the damage. Um, but that, you know, this area is going to take a long time to recover, in my opinion. This is a couple of years um, worth of damage and um, we'll see how it, how it plays out. But, um, you know, we appreciate any support and any any national media attention we can bring to the Appalachian region is is certainly welcomed. Uh, we need it and, and we need to help. Is is there a way that our viewers, listeners can help if they want to is is there a website they should go to or any, any yeah organization i think the red, help? red cross the red cross is super involved in this deal and i think they're taking donations um you know food and water and gasoline are still uh, at a high premium in this 30 mile radius um trying to get gas and food into Asheville um and Irwin Tennessee really the two most affected areas around here um so any way you can support there would be awesome but I just think bringing national media attention would be big um, to this area. And and this is a tough blue collar city and blue collar area. As you know, the Appalachian region has got some tough people and um, it, it's a blue collar. And, and this this area will bounce back and um, we'll be we'll be we'll bounce back and be ready to go. Well, you, you guys had had an unbelievable 
experience this week, and I, I imagine it makes you a tougher, better team. But getting yeah, through this no is, is everybody's got to got to band together. It sounds like. So. Yeah, this is this is the kind of thing that can kind of you know this. You'll be talking about this forty years from now as a as a program and as a team, as as friends and family. Um, you know, I'll never forget it, um, and I don't think our players will either. But you know, it would make the story even better if we went on to to accomplish great things as a team, and. You know, it's big to win that game, and it's great to talk about that Saturday. But what if what if we really uh, banded together and got close and found a way to win a bunch of close games here down the stretch, and uh, somehow won the Southern Conference, somehow made a playoff run? That would be that would be an even better story. Uh, but our our kids are are locked in, they're focused. We're giving them the day off today, and we'll we'll start on Chattanooga tomorrow. Well, good luck, Coach. We appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks, thank Coach. you, guys.